And like I said, you'll get the follow-up recording. All right, welcome to the masterclass for planning a pivot. This is, is this our first alumni masterclass this quarter? Yes, it is. There's two more coming up. Sorry, I have to save some recordings. Um, that screen share, did it just, okay, no, it, let me get my window back to the front. I'm sorry. I just recorded the previous session and now it's interrupting me. And now this is all on record. So you guys can watch this fun part when you watch the video. Okay, we're back. Um, the next two sessions are work-life balance oriented and using your strengths at work. And that one is going to be delivered by Karen McCoy. I'm really excited about it because she is Gallup Strength certified. So she's gonna be talking about how to make, using some of those parameters, using your strengths at work. So we're really excited about that. I'm also very open to ideas. So if you have ideas for other content or workshops for the alumni masterclass, we haven't had a lot of feedback from alumni. So I'm always looking for ideas. Um, so if you have some, share those with me. I'll put my email address in the chat at the end or even throw them in the chat now. Okay. so. We want to make sure that there's some normalization around the concept of a pivot like and I think this is particularly hard for people my age to understand, but Gen Z knows that pivots going to be the name of the game for their careers like things are changing drastically and quickly and there are many different reasons you might have a desire to move around in your career. The average Gen Z employee is going to be in their role for three years like that's wild to me. Uh, and that's kind of the wave of the future, but that opens up a lot of opportunity. And there are, the pandemic has totally changed the career space. And I think for some people have re has really changed the way we look at work-life balance, the way we look at what are the most important functions of our role. So this is a really good time to dip into what is a pivot and then what are the parts of that pivot? So, we have eight steps. I know it sounds like a lot, um, but each step is meant to be like a micro step so that this is super actionable. We don't want this to feel like something that happens overnight. And there are parts of this you've probably already started. Um, and we wanna make sure that we can make each one of these actions kind of small enough that it doesn't feel like you're tackling too much at one time. So we'll talk about each one of these steps and I'll also be highlighting some resources we have in the career library that will help you accomplish some of these steps. Now, if I were doing this like detail, this would take a very long time. So I'm gonna do fairly surface level as far as these strategies, but know that we have a lot of coaching and career counseling and resources that can support you along this process. Um, so one of the things that, in every handout in this presentation will be attached to the follow-up email. So you don't even have to go look for those. Um, some of these are handouts that we actually use in some of our classes, so they're not all on the website. But for example, this mapping your career options is a worksheet that we've developed just to start big thinking, you know, asking yourself bigger questions. Maybe you know where you want to go. Maybe you know that you don't know where you want to go. Um, and we want to meet your needs depend, you know, regardless of where you are in that. So thinking through what am I really good at functionally? Like my job title might be, you know, so my job title is, what is it? Director of Career Education. That doesn't, what am I good at? Am I good at directing? To be frank, no, and Ed can speak to that. Am I good at making things? Absolutely. So I know what I'm good at, and that kind of self-awareness can be really hard, especially for anyone who has imposter syndrome. And I know we associate that with younger people, but I think women have been socialized to have this. It can be really hard to think through, what am I good at? Um, that's where a career conversation can be helpful. But that's why we created this worksheet because it does ask these big questions. One of them is if, if a benefactor gave you $1 billion to start your own business or a nonprofit, what would it be? Like that's a big question that you can kind of answer intuitively just to start thinking through. And like I said, maybe you know exactly what you wanna do, but it can be helpful to think through some of these more kind of abstract whys and hows. Um, what do you wish you could do more in your current role? Maybe the pivot isn't a 180, maybe it's a 20 degree. Uh, angle that you're going for. So what could you be doing more in your current role? And that's where we sometimes coach folks like, hey, there's a world where this isn't really a pivot, but it's kind of like, a, I need a better, what's a good word, Ed? I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm thinking- a, tweak. a tweak. A tweak. That's a better word. That's great. I keep thinking, I'm swimming in my head right now and I'm like, it's like a flip turn. I don't know. Um, 
what is the source of your current dissatisfaction? If you're truly dissatisfied, some people who look for a pivot aren't dissatisfied. They're perfectly happy. They are just excited about another opportunity. But do think through, is it the work? Is it the environment? You know, when I was commuting into DePaul, I, there was a cost, a mental cost to that commute for me um, in terms of running for the train, running for the train, picking up the kids. Like, and it, I wasn't dissatisfied with my work, but there was this other context that kind of sometimes made me feel a certain way about my job. Sometimes it's the company culture. I mean, currently I'm, I've never reported to a boss that made me as happy as my current boss, but I have definitely been in previous iterations where I was like, you know, I might stay here except, right? Like maybe I like the work, but I don't love the culture or I don't love whatever's happening. So thinking through and analyzing your situation, this is something you can either do on your own, but it's also something we can have a career conversation with you about. And we'll obviously be following up with this little worksheet. This is kind of just the abstract piece of it. On a more tactical level, step two is to really, and you can do these out of order. They're not really sequential. Step two is really inventorying what skills do you have and what skill interests do you have? Like, and this is where we're gonna talk about leaning into the pivot. You might have a job title that you understand, but have you sat down in the last year, especially considering the amount of change we've had and really looked at how your skills have changed over the course of your career? Have you, just, have you sat down and inventoried? Like for example, a year ago, I didn't have the level of expertise I had on um, Zoom, on Asana, on Teams, like all kinds of remote technology tools that I didn't have. And in fact, my job was different because most of our advising was truly a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now I'm doing a ton more event design, content preparation, you know, a lot more of this other kind of work so I would have to sit down and think, what are the skills I have now that I didn't have before? And really understanding and being able to identify what those skills are. And then what skills do you have that you're not using right now that you would like to be using more? That's uh, kind of a harder question because it's a little more abstract, but if you think through like, I think the, the backwards way to that is like, what are the things I would, I would wanna do in my job? And then thinking through what are those skills associated with that. Uh, and then this can also be broader. Like, what are your passions? Like, I think there's a lot of people. The pandemic has really brought up a lot of, a lot of attention into public health. There's a lot of people who probably didn't think about public health the same way they do now. And they might have developed a more serious passion for that as a potential career space. This could also relate to trends. So there are like changing industries. So hospitality has crashed. But all of a sudden, for people who are interested in events and experiences, there's this whole digital experience realm that didn't exist before. So you might have evolving passions based on even those kinds of trends. And like I said, feel free to interrupt if there's questions. Uh, this handout that we're referencing here kind of talks through how to identify your skills, and it does have a skills checklist on the back, um, kind of around those broader categories of soft skills. Now that Ed's here, I do feel like I have to pause every once in a while, Ed, just so that you don't think I'm a lunatic. I don't normally pause. <sighs> I can take a breath. Um, step three is to start to brainstorm new career directions. Like you might be coming to this workshop at step five already. You might have done a lot of this, but this is a really important step. And one of the things that we connect you to in terms of a, a tool for this are some of our career assessments. Um, we'll include a link to a tool we offer access to called Career Explorer. Um, I really, um, something about my personality, I've always hated career tests, absolutely. They make me wanna, I'm just like, how dare you try and tell me what I wanna do? I don't trust them at all. But one thing I'll say about Career Explorer is it's a real experience. Like if you let go and you, I'm sure you, some of you remember what was it called, the DAT in middle school, where you had to say whether or not you like digging ditches or you know, pumping gas or whatever? Like, there's a couple questions like that, but if you power through this assessment, it tells you a lot about who you are. And I don't necessarily agree with all the career matches, but it gives you some useful insights. And there's a lot of different assessments. We'll link to a couple in the follow-up email. Career Explorer is a great one. I actually really like 
16 personalities. Ed, what's yeah, no, Ed loves 16 personalities. These are all be they're free assessments, and they just kind of give you a bird's eye view that you wouldn't necessarily have about who you are. You don't have to trust them. You don't have to believe in the science of it. It's a good experience to start to like force yourself to think through what what's the intersection between my values and a career and my skills. Um, it's also good to talk to family, friends, and colleagues. This is where we'll get to networking, I think, a little bit later. But um, career advisors, of course, also help this. So I, when I'm working with someone, I have an MFA in sculpture. There was, there is no career path for an MFA in sculpture. And I feel that was a luxury for me in that I never thought there was an A, B, and then a C step. I knew I would just, someone would pay me to do something I could stand doing. Like that was my whole goal. Find a job that I didn't hate, and I, you know, figured it out like that. That is, that's almost too many options for some people. But I knew that for me, brainstorming new directions was about where I wanted to either work in a museum or a university or a cultural institution. Cause that's, I just love school. Like I just love schools and I love learning and all of that. So starting with space made sense for me. Starting with function might make more sense for you. So it kind of depends, but there's ways to map that. We actually have a mapping your options handout we can include in our follow-up. Ed, what did you know about your career when you were in college? I think it was space. <clears throat> you knew. I grew up on a college campus for 10 years. So um, I just knew that I wanted to be in some kind of edu college scene, but didn't know the role if it was professor or advisor or a coordinator. And the last one was definitely not my role. I'm not a coordinator of any kind, but. Yeah. Well, and that's, there's like a freedom to that. And I think that that's where some of the younger folks are actually disadvantaged because they're told all the time, pick your major because your major is the job you're going to get, which is true for accounting. But the difference between having an accounting job at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and having an accounting job at a corporate accounting firm, those jobs don't have that much in common. So like, I think it's helpful to know that it's a skills economy. So you have a lot of options. It could be skill-based, it could be space-based. That's kind of the way that we contextualize it at DePaul. Step four, let me see if, I don't know, I don't know if this blocks for you, but let me move that for a second. Research specific jobs. So as you start to get into a narrower focus, um, I think it's really good to look at job postings. I always start there because the industries have changed so much that I don't know what's going on until I look at what's listed right now. Who's hiring? Because that matters, right? That being said, once the vaccine is out and restaurants reopen and hotels reopen, like the tourism and hospitality industry will shift. Even media is going to shift. But at the same time, it's useful to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of what the market wants. And that's really through job postings. And what I love about the way we search for jobs now, you guys are probably too young to remember newspapers where you, you put a little highlighter on the job you're interested in. But now it's keyword based. You can get yourself on Indeed, which is the messiest job board, but my favorite. Throw in a keyword like operations. Throw in a keyword like communications, throw in a keyword like museum. It could be a function, it could be a space. And you're gonna teach yourself what the market is doing right now. Uh, we're still catching up, just as one thing, just one thing to know, we're still really catching up from the holidays, everything slows down. And I'll say this about the pandemic, the timelines are really unpredictable. You might see a ton of jobs posted and then a month break and then more. Uh, we'll see how the economy shifts a little bit. So what you see in March won't be what you see in August at all. But this will teach you a little bit about what the market wants right now. And it will also teach you about emerging markets that maybe weren't on your radar before. So for example, like for me, I, I've seen a lot of jobs in corporate training. That has exploded because everyone's moved remotely. So remote management is now this thing and everyone has to upscale on Zoom and upscale on this. So corporate training is in demand. Um, ed tech, full explosion. Does that mean you have to be a K-12 teacher to be interested in that? No, you might be a social media person 
who is interested in ed tech. So there's a lot of industry research that you're gonna be doing just by looking at job postings. The other thing we wanna make sure that folks consider is considering a new role in your field. Like that's a pivot that has lubrication essentially. Like you might have a colleague who's in an operations role and you're in more of a management role and you can start to shift. Certain industries have more opportunities to do that. Higher ed is a really easy place to do that. Um, but it, it helps you leverage your contacts in your industry. Um, and then we really recommend informational interviews as part of this research because it has a dual purpose. Number one, it tells you a little bit about some pathways folks have taken. Um, and frankly, even shopping LinkedIn and watching, observing other people's pathways can be very educational. Um, you'll find other pivoters and see how they did it. Um, but it also builds your network for when you are in the search mode and when you're out trying to be competitive in the search. This handout we have here that we'll attach is, um, has a sample informational interview request and you can send people emails, you can put it in the connect message on LinkedIn, that's my pro tip, don't pay for messaging, put it in a connect message on LinkedIn, we really don't want you to have to pay for pro, it's very expensive. And if you do the free trial, give yourself a deadline. What is it, like 80 bucks? Is that what it is, Ed? Do you know? I don't know. It's bonkers expensive. I mean, if you were deep in a search, it might be worth a free trial, but otherwise you can sneak a little informational interview request in a connect message. The other thing you want to do is really prepare to fill the gaps, meaning there's all kinds of ways. You can upskill, you can participate in professional associations, you could take a course on Udemy. Like there's a lot of training now where you could basically certify yourself as eligible through your own self-guided learning without paying for academic credits or an expensive learning opportunity. So like you'll see a lot of marketing around Harvard and Stanford have these like $8,000 certificate programs for pivoters great. But I don't want everyone to feel like they have to do that. You, there's a way to do this inexpensively. That's another career conversation we can have in the career center with you around how to build some of those, some of that knowledge. Now, things that require certification like Google Analytics, um, even project management, there's like a really high desired certification in project, pro project management. Um, those roles are sometimes worth it in terms of filling the gaps with like an official formal certification. But otherwise, there's a million ways to upskill. And we do have a series of skill labs that we do with folks so that they can kind of get ideas for how to do this inexpensively. Like my goal is to make sure people know there's a free way to do a lot of this. Not everything, but a lot of that. Um, and it is a combination of research, classes, seminars, webinars, all kinds of stuff like that. And we, this of course is our handout on like how to engage with the professional associations um, to, in the target areas that you're interested in. Any questions about any of this like upskilling or filling the gaps? Somebody's asked about in chat, my biggest question is what software to choose when depending on the company, the software is vastly different. Yeah, and that is, the, this is the advice we give to Paul students. Obviously, micro, basic Google Suite and Microsoft Office knowledge is very important. No question. You, that's all free to learn. Um, and when I put that on my resume, I do parenthetically do Word, Outlook, PowerPoint, et cetera, because with applicant tracking systems, you don't know which thing they're looking for. So I include the whole list. Um, if you're looking at, let's say, four out of seven jobs you're interested in want Salesforce, Force yourself to watch an hour long, half an hour long video on YouTube about Salesforce. Maybe there's a free download. Salesforce is a great example because it's actually a little harder to learn because there isn't a free download. <laughs> um, what that does for you is it then in the interview, first of all, if it's something that you're like, man, I've used something like this before. If that's gonna keep you out of the interview, I would add it to my resume. And then in the interview, I'd say, yeah, I had, you know, I used it very briefly in a previous role, but I'm great at learning technology. 
So if a job has a named program that, and this varies, this is why it's kind of one-on-one -on -one advising when we do this. If it says you need to know C+, I'm never going to recommend pretending you know C+, right? That's not something you're going to pick up. That's not a proprietary tool that you have transferable knowledge of. Salesforce, though, it's like a basically a database, right? So it's a learnable thing. And you can decide for yourself how learnable any one of these things are. Um, a lot of the other technologies like Google Analytics, HubSpot, they have free training that you dip into. You do not need to be an expert to put technology on your resume. You need to get that resume through the applicant tracking system. So in the interview, you can speak to the other kinds of technology you've taught yourself. Like I, my knowledge of HTML is very little. And this is content management systems are my favorite example of this. Because, um, so I've built a website using, I'm a hundred. So I used BB Edit, I used Go Live, um, I've used, in BB Edit, I had to use HTML. I used Squarespace, I've used Wix, right? I've used all of these tools. If that employer wants me to know Wix, am I gonna dip in and make sure I've touched it for a minute? Absolutely. But when I'm moving in higher ed, my previous role, we used Drupal, which I loved, so at DePaul, if they had a question about SharePoint, I'd say, you know what, I've never used SharePoint, but I know Drupal, Wix, Squarespace, I'm very comfortable learning content management systems. And that's where knowing the category of knowledge is really useful and why I have a separate section for technology and a separate section for skills. In technology, I'll identify Wix, I'm never putting Squarespace, but I might put like Drupal, SharePoint, et cetera. And then in skills, I'm gonna put content management systems. And that way I've kind of covered my bases. Sorry, that took, that was like a real random technology turn. Okay, and then six, where do we go from? Filling the gaps. Then you're gonna really think about your brand. And this is kind of coming back to, oh, some of the earlier questions, um, which was like, this is again where you're gonna potentially lean in and think through how does your previous experience make you particularly interesting to an employer for this role. And defining this as an asset, not a deficit. Um, and I, from my own experience, when I was earlier in my career in higher ed, I would hide my degree at the bottom. My MFA freaked people out. I literally carved wood for two years. There was nothing about that program that gave me the skills I used in my job, except my graduate assistantship, right? Like I ran a writing center. So I would hide that MFA because it would make people, like their heads would explode. Um, as I moved further into my career though, and I had more and more experience, I started really leaning into that because I didn't have to convince them I knew what I was doing. I had enough experience that I was like, this is why my MFA and my studio practice makes me really good in these roles in higher ed. And I went from, and this doesn't sound like a big pivot, but in higher ed, it gets real narrow. I went from running a writing center to academic advising, which doesn't sound unrelated, but in higher ed, they're like, what? Like, how is that possible? Um, and I really leaned in on the fact that like, this is, you know, writing is what, one of the core skills and managing students and da, da da Anyway, I really had to think through every single move I did. I had to think through how am I, I was like, I'm a very competitive person because I have a twin sister. I would always dream up my nightmare candidate, right? And your nightmare candidate is someone who fits the mold perfectly. And then if you can do a little creative thinking and think, how am I competitive with them? What do they, what do I have that they don't? And that's like a fun, empowering exercise. And if that's not something that comes intuitively to you, that's our job. Like, right, Ed, I feel like we are cheerleaders half the time. Yeah, I think a lot of it is uh, encouraging folks to remember that they um, have a skill that not everybody does and not everybody wants to. And even if someone does have that skill, it doesn't mean they want to use it. Um, 
simple things. I'm good at washing dishes. I don't enjoy it. So some people think that. I know it's real simple, but it's, it's, it's true. So anyway. Well, and I think that increasingly roles are very hybridized. So if you've, there's some roles, like if, if you've ever worked with data, there's not a single job that's not going to benefit from that. Truly. If you have budget management experience, that's huge. Like there's a lot of things that you don't imagine would necessarily be in demand, but no one has a secretary anymore. We're all our own secretaries. So project management, budget management, um, communication, all of these are very important. And thinking through how that lines up, that is an art and it's also a muscle that you really build through this process. So if you feel like this is hard for me for this job, it only gets easier as you start to do it. But this also means getting into your social media. And I don't mean tweeting like industry leaders every day, but it is meaningful to get some thought leaders you're following in your new industries and areas so that you have the most contemporary language when you're in an interview. And also making sure your LinkedIn does the job it needs to do. Now that's the sweet spot. The LinkedIn is the sweet spot. Because if you're pivoting into one specific space, great, that's easy to talk about. If you're pivoting into a couple different options within that space, like for me, um, I was open to pivoting in museum. I would be excited to do museum education, museum research, development, whatever. I wanted to do anything within a museum. Then it gets a little harder on LinkedIn to make an umbrella account because you only have the one profile. You can't customize like you can a resume but that's the kind of thing that we can help you with. Are there questions about the social media piece of it? Not yet, okay. All right, customizing. I just finished um, a 50 minute presentation on customizing uh, your resume and cover letter that kind of goes through where and how you do that. Um, it's a time management challenge more than anything. And it's also a project management challenge because if you can track a little bit of this customization, maybe you end up with, depending on the kinds of roles you're pivoting into, you might have three categories of jobs, right? That means you only need to customize three resumes and cover letters and then baby tweaks all along. If you have five categories of jobs, you've got five resumes and cover letters that you're customizing and each one of those will probably take about an hour the first time you do it. And then the next time, seven minutes, because you are tracking the different documents and materials you have. LinkedIn, like I said, is the only thing where you only have the one. And that's the one that's an art, not a science. Meaning you have to have that umbrella work for all of your pivot targets or just the one, if you just have one. Um, let me see if I go, okay, I don't actually get into it here, but I will, I'll add the slide deck for tailoring your resume and cover letter to the follow-up email. Cause I don't, my, it's hard for me not to just do everything in one session. I'm trying not to do that right now, but that slide deck will have more information about where and how. I'm obsessed with resume summaries currently. So there's a whole bit of information there about having a quick little short summary at the top of your resume that is like, um, and especially for pivoters, because you can lead with something at the top, like um, experience operations professional, pivoting into a role, marketing role, da, 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 with skills and experience in this. Like you tell your whole story at the top of your resume and that creates immediacy and is a great way to customize. Um, but I, that will be in the deck that I attach. Again, and I have a problem. Don't you just mm -hmm. want to talk for 12 hours and get no, all those tips normal. out? I'd like to add to the summary. I've always oh, sure. thought of it as a baby cover letter that, you know, um, cover letter you always tweak, but your summary is also, it's, it's tedious to have to, uh, to, to tweak your resumes um, or look for that resume that fits and tweak that. But the, the summary can be like a little, the little tweakable nuanced thing that acts like a baby cover letter for you. That's yeah, and, and what I'll add is also, Pivoters benefit from functional resumes sometimes. So rather than a, just a good old reverse chronological, dividing your experience up into experience sections that are based on skills 
So marketing experience, let's say research experience, whatever it is, and then you manage the order. So you get to actually put things on top um, that weren't necessarily most recent. It gets tricky though when it gets longer and longer and longer. And I'm just gonna be real about the age bias. I've been thinking about the age bias in my own search for probably the last like four or five years. Um, because it's just something you have to manage, right? So when I, like I took graduation years off my resume. Um, and it depends on industry. Honestly, gender plays a role here too. So it's, it's a mix of things you have to consider in terms of how, how far back you can go in your experience. For some roles, being in a role for 20 years and then pivoting is great. For other roles, they're like, how could they possibly have contemporary knowledge of this industry? So it's kind of a puzzle. Um, okay, the next step here is to get the word out. Really get out there and get some networking. We talked a little about informational interviews as part of the research process, but it's also really important because, what is it, Ed? Is it like 85% of jobs are never posted? Yeah, it's 80 plus. Yeah. Which it means which, if you're- which, which was historically what they always say. Cause it used to be legally, you know, couldn't post it unless it went through HR, but there's a lot of things that just get filled. They may have already, here's, the, here's what that means. Mm -hmm. Be filled in the back of somebody's manager's head, but they may have put it out there with HR, but they've already got an idea of who they want. Yeah, and this is particularly important for pivoters because you want to get to the top of the deck, right? Like you don't want to be lost in the middle where they're like, I don't totally get this. But if you're networking and you apply to a role and you have a network, you have a, a contact at that company, you can be like, hey, will you ping them and let them know I applied? That's gonna get you a deeper look than the surface look. And sometimes you need a deeper look. Like I can tell you, I applied for career advising jobs at the University of Chicago. They had zero interest in me. And I've been doing this for 18 years when I'm applying for those roles. And that's because I think, and I, there's a lot of reasons, I'm not the best, but I think that MFA was still terrifying them. I think they were like, D I'm looking for someone with a counseling degree. It says it right here on this application. And I have basically tricked my way into, other ro into these roles that are normally for people with this particular degree by networking. I'll even, in my last search when I was in Boston, I did an informational interview because I was applying to two roles at the same university with the same employer. And I said, hey, I'm gonna be applying to these two. Can I do an informational interview with you about the difference between them? Because they have a lot in common. I'd love to learn more. I got that job. And I don't think it was because of the informational interview, but boy, did that strengthen my application. So that's something that you can be doing as well. Some employers can't, like when people reach out to me to see if I can do an informational interview for a job, I truly typically do not have the time, um, but it's not bad. Um, and I do love it when people send me their application materials directly. I might have a slide about that. If I don't, I'll remind you about that. Um, in terms of the launch plan, we wanna make sure that you guys feel equipped to actually make this plan and to think about, are there financial implications? So there are industries that don't pay particularly well. If you're living life as a corporate accountant and you're like, I can't do this, the grind is too much. I really wanna do, I wanna be in a, I wanna pivot to nonprofit or I wanna pivot to this other role. You do have to be really aware around Average salaries. Glassdoor is a great resource, but networking is a great resource too, in terms of like asking what's a starting salary, what's a mid-level salary. One of the hardest things to do is to figure out, am I going lateral or am I starting over? More people should be going lateral or up than starting over. That's what I'll say. Like, I feel like every time I talk to a pivoter, they're like, oh, I should probably start at the bottom. And I'm like, no, 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 no then you're competing with 23 year olds who don't need to make a bunch of money and your salary is going to be lower. Why don't we make an argument for you going right in the middle? Your transferable skills are going to make you equipped in that area. In the reality, there's sometimes a reason to start over, but you have to think through benefits. You have to think through salary. And I would definitely recommend creating a time frame that's generous to you 
that creates an action plan, basically. I'm gonna do this this month, I'm gonna focus on this this month. You're not gonna necessarily follow it. I also really believe in communities, having a community around this pivot, working with other pivoters and having some accountability conversations so that you can kind of keep on track. That's what we can do with you as well in the career advising appointment. Ed does a lot of follow-up appointments with people to just check in on where they're at in the process. All the time. Actually, uh, just to backtrack just a smidge, I did get a question here on the chat. Okay. Good one. And it's, um, the question is, you mentioned gender playing a role in job hunting. So um, I have a first name that most people assume is male. And I've gotten to interviews where the hiring manager is surprised to see a woman walk in. I've gotten to the point where I've added my very feminine middle name to my resume to avoid confusion, but I wonder if it would be more beneficial to take advantage of people thinking I'm a man, especially in the tech industry roles. Any thoughts? That's great. Uh, Ed, do you remember when Shannon Faulkner was admitted to the Air Force? Sorry, I'm not going to get into this story, but that's a reminder. That's a very, that story is yeah. very depressing. Um, I think one thing to note is that there is diversity recruitment in tech for women. So on the surface, at least, um, and this is what's always so complicated around identities because of course there's diversity of recruitment, but there's also a ton of bias, right? And those two things go hand in hand and you can't always tell which one's gonna be a factor. I'm a big fan of A-B testing, of really in some cases leading in, in some cases not revealing your gender. Um, I think the ones where you'd want to reveal your gender are ones where you get an inkling that there's a diversity initiative and you would definitely, and even if you didn't, there's a lot of different ways to signal diversity in a cover letter um, so that if that's something they're thinking about, because I think that we have to acknowledge bias and we have, it's just a weird balance in terms of acknowledging those biases. In terms of age, there's a lot of tips and tricks for just like obscuring your age and you know making sure your profile picture doesn't give too much away in terms of gender some of it is thinking through do i want to work somewhere where that's a factor you know but you need a job so i don't know that's not really an answer but i think there's a world where you a b test and i think that's a great question for people when you're networking because they're going to have that industry's experience of that uh, but do keep in mind that there's places and times where you'll want to signal yourself as a diverse candidate um, because that's part of, particularly right now, there's a lot of initiatives around that, but that's not to say that they're all wildly authentic. Ed, what kind of advice do you normally give around that? That one I might, in, in addition, I like what you said, in addition, I might even bring up something around initials. Some people feel more comfortable just going with like PJ or something like that, mm -hmm. um, where it's neutral. So, um, and then there's also going to be the fact they're probably going to Google you anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your LinkedIn. On your LinkedIn profile. And I think the good news is that as younger people are in hiring positions, I am optimistic about that shifting. I'm also optimistic about tools like LinkedIn. And actually there's, Deloitte has this whole article in their trends report about how technology has the opportunity to totally lead in the DEI space. Like, of course, we assume that like there's a lot of information they're not gleaning, but then, you know, you can tell by what car insurance rates, whether or not you're male or female, they figured out from your shopping pattern. But I'm optimistic that that'll shift a little bit, but it's good to be aware of and it's good to be observant about. Um, it's a complex issue, particularly around identities. I actually have a couple more questions if you're down for uh, sure. Let me mention really quickly, pronouns are increasingly common on resumes. There's going to be some industries and people of certain ages who they're like, what? Like this will sound crazy to them, but the students I'm working with, a lot of them put pronouns on their resume. That does, and it does speak to, particularly for identities, that sometimes helps you eliminate environments that aren't friendly to those identities. Go ahead, Ed. What else do we got? So here's another one, but this is a different one. Um, speaking of LinkedIn and the profile, uh, what are the pros and cons? And this comes up quite a bit. What are the pros and cons if you have a side hustle and it's listed on your LinkedIn profile? So let's say you've been working the side hustle and now you want to tailor your resume to a new position but not related to your side hustle. It depends on the industry, frankly. 
Um, and it depends on how good you are at telling that story. Because I think like in the creative industries, they are drawn to candidates who have this other thing, right? Because that's who they are. You know, they, a lot of folks in advertising or marketing are coming from these other spaces. Um, higher ed is also very friendly to that because they think of the whole person, right? And they're like, they just have this more kind of nuanced approach. I think in other industries and frankly, even in consulting, I know the like old school consulting resume advice was to put that you like French cooking on your resume, right? Because they want to make sure you're not a robot. So I think that it depends on how you either integrate it or don't integrate it. I would just say don't make it a distraction. And it's kind of like some of these distinctions where if it's something you care about a lot and it's not controversial, you can lean in on it a little bit, but make sure that you're leading with the most relevant experience. Does that make sense, Ed? Yeah, I, I like that because it's true. It's, some folks may see it as a con, that, like you said, or a distraction, or does this person? How does this person have time to do their job if they have the second job? That could simply be one perspective. But I That's think true. most people are, um, yeah, they can see it as full balance, uh, a complementary skill set. I just think the main thing is make sure it's not a non-compete type of situation. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that would not work, yeah. or something controversial. Yeah, taxidermy. It might be distracting. <laughs> Are there other questions in the chat, Ed? Uh, there, let's see. I think there's one here that maybe we could do. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And do you suggest or recommend having your resume job history viewable on your LinkedIn profile? I'm, it's always mixed for me because that LinkedIn media viewer is gross. Like it's pixelated half the time. I am just kind of obsessed with how things look. So it makes me a little bonkers. Um, the other part of it is that LinkedIn isn't meant to look like a resume anyway. Um, but that being said, here's what I will tell you. This isn't a great answer now, but I have asked our employer engagement team to reach out to employers because what I want to provide for you guys is what does an employer see on LinkedIn? I have no idea. I don't have a recruiter function on LinkedIn. I have been dying to know this for the last like three months when it occurred to me, wait, do they see my, my skills match? You know how when you're on LinkedIn and you look at a job and it says this percentage of skills match, do they see that? Do they care? So that's something we're trying to work on is knowledge around that. Um, I don't think it's ever gonna be bad. I don't think there's a cost to it unless you're one of those people who's customizing your resumes and your LinkedIn is an umbrella where you keep it a little more general, um, then I think having a really customized resume that doesn't match the role that you're applying to could be a risk. Otherwise, I think it's fine. I hate that it pixelates. I do love the rich media function. I think people don't use it enough, um, but it depends on your situation. I might also add that it, the dates are also on there. So if that's a concern, yeah um that might be something to keep in mind yeah you'd be surprised at how much like especially with the summary the summary is going to change by the role um the other things that might change are order so you'd have to have like a really evergreen resume that you use generally to have on there but don't feel like you're recreating the resume on your linkedin like it's just different it's meant to be a different kind of tool and it, i generally don't even recommend full-on accomplishment statements in linkedin i mean i think it can work my best LinkedIn advice is find someone in the industry you're targeting who does it the best and do everything they do. Like, it's just easier to just find like an aspirational LinkedIn profile and then make it match what they're doing. Obviously you're not copying and pasting, but you're getting inspo, it's like Pinterest. We have a couple bonus resources I wanna show you. Um, this tool, MC Skills Match, is currently free I don't know that they're planning on monetizing this. Um, MC is a data company that pulls information from uh, LinkedIn profiles and job postings. So it's very up to date, like it's constantly adapting. Um, and it's a new product. So it doesn't, depending on your background and interest, it's not always like, it doesn't have always the most relevant information for you, but I think it's a particularly attractive interface um, you can explore new career paths here. It does ask you to put in a ton of information. You don't have to create a login to do that. You can, 
Um, they don't do a ton of email marketing. I get a lot of stuff because I'm in higher ed, uh, but I think it's a fun product. And what I like about it is if I go through here and I'm just gonna do, whoops, does it not have art? Let's see, status. Obviously I completely did that. It'll start to accumulate skills so I can do by job title. No, let's go back. Let's do by education. It'll tell me what skills it thinks I have. Oh, no skill <laughs> suggestions for art. That's classic. Let me go back to, oh, I don't want to edit that. Sorry. Continue to skills. Let's do by job title. Oh, my job title's not going to help, but we're going to do it. So I'll just do career. I should have done career counselor, but look at that. It ideated a ton of skills that I'm not, I wouldn't have Medicaid. That's not quite there, but this is an interesting tool. It gives you matches. Um, I think it's a fun tool to use for starting this kind of process. They also have a really fabulous resume optimizer that we recommend a lot of times. Um, another resource for those of you who are <coughs> interested in upskilling, this is a website that provides, it's basically a catalog of courses across the internet on any topic. So I can go to, let's say I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna upskill in marketing. It'll give me these listings of the 10 best. Many are free, they're not all free. The one thing, the caveat I'll give you about this website is their profit model is based on having some people promote their products through them. So some of them are like, they would get money if you signed up for a paid product, but they also have a ton of free lists that are great because it can be hard to keep track of Udemy, Coursera, all those other options. So I like this site just as a starting point for like, okay, if I'm gonna click on just free courses and it'll, oh, Allison's another great site, but this will, it can help me by category. Let me go back to that front page. It's very like this. Um, I think that's a pretty useful site. It's updated all the time. Um, another thing I'll tell you is we also have a YouTube library of all of our Career Center presentations. It's loading right here. Uh, right now, it doesn't have the most recent presentations. You can see we have a lot of career community uh, presentations that range from like this education nonprofit. Wow, it went straight to this presentation. I don't want to do that. Uh, let's view the playlist. So you can see there's a nonprofit and service programs panel. There's a museum panel that's going to be added on here. I will also include in the follow-up email, there's a Google Doc that has all the links of the presentations we gave last quarter. Um, in case you're interested, these are not the slide decks or the actual presentations, but there are skills labs, our toolkits, and then our alumni master classes from last quarter. And there's one just on upskilling. Uh, but the, the one I gave earlier this quarter is five free online certificates, goes through all of those um, course providers that I talked about, like Allison and Udemy and Coursera. That's really mostly for upskilling. Um, let's see if I have any. I want to make sure that you know that career advisors are available to you. If you don't have a Handshake account, um, there's a form on our website that you can use to request one, but you would typically make an appointment through Handshake or you could call our front desk. We have virtual office hours to make an appointment. Um, we have an email resume review service. It's brand new. Uh, there's been some lag issues because it was more popular than we predicted. I actually think you get more out of a one-on-one -on -one conversation than an email resume review, but that's open to you if you're busy. We have our career library. Um, we also want to make sure you know about alumni sharing knowledge. Great place to reach out for informational interviews. That's a platform that you use your Campus Connect credentials to get into. All of these links will be in the follow-up email. Um, we have a bunch of, these are all the skills labs that remain this quarter. Um, survey design, content marketing. If these skills are of interest to you, you can RSVP, you'll get the recording. One I want to draw your attention to is salary negotiation. It's a little bit different than the other labs, but boy, is that useful. And that's going to be presented by a recruiter. So I'm really excited to have an employer partner on that event. Um, and then we have a master of the interview workshop coming up as well. And all of these events, you can RSVP and we send the recordings and the slide decks as well as relevant links. Um, let's see. 
I'm going to, I hope there's a couple more questions, but while I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to send a poll out while we find out if there's any more questions. Like I said before, I love getting feedback from folks. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about your ideas or what you would like to happen or what you would like to see. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, I do see, is it okay to remove my oldest roles or should I include everything since college? I'll tell you right now, I, um, if I'm obscuring my age, I will remove older roles. If I've got plenty of experience and I don't need that one, absolutely. Um, so it depends on what your motives are. If your motives are to obscure your age or not confuse anyone about your age, absolutely, it's okay. As long as you ha have those skills and experience from another opportunity. There's no such thing as a transcript for jobs, thank God. I would never want anyone, if I had, oh my goodness, the cabinet factory, the lifeguarding, the truck stop. The truck Everybody, stop was good. Oof. If you haven't been to our place in Morris, Illinois, and tried the Big Ethel, I actually don't recommend it at all. I'm so old that they made me tell them on my application if I was single, married, widowed, engaged, <laughs> divorced. That's illegal. Any other questions? Let me see, did I mention, yeah, any other questions you guys have or ideas? I can't believe you guys got away without one of my children coming in and interrupting me. I apologize, it would have been a lot of fun. Or practicing drums, that could have happened. All right, well, I hope you guys join us for our next alumni masterclass on work-life balance. It's a topic I need help with. Um, so ironically, I'll be presenting that. So it's really do what I say, not what I do. Um, and then Karen's gonna be doing the strengths course, which I think is gonna be a ton of fun. And Ed, I'm gonna recommend that you come to all of these. Ed's made the biggest mistake you can make in a job, which is being very useful. And uh, then we try and abuse it as much as possible, right Ed? That's right. No, it's all good. Feel free to follow up. If anybody needs any advising or on career pivoting, feel free to hit me up for Ed's all over Handshake. And he, he has earned the title of the most fun advisor. Mm. And I think Sydney in Media Communication Arts Entertainment is officially the second most fun. But Jen <laughs> in Education and Private and Government is the nicest. And I think Kaylin in Business keeps it the most real. And Lauren in tech is the calmest advisor, right, Ed, when you say that? Oh, my gosh. I wish I could be like that. Drama free. Oh, my gosh. All right. You guys have a great night. Thanks for coming.